Our guest is the Senate Finance Chairman, Senator Eric Tarr. Eric, good morning. Thanks for being with us. Oh, good morning. I appreciate the invite. Absolutely. So uh, since we've spoken, a couple things have happened, uh, not the least of which is the uh, $4.6 billion budget. I see it worked its way through yesterday. Also, the governor found $850 million in additional revenue for the next fiscal year. Let's talk about money first. That's your specialty as the uh, Senate Finance Chairman. So let's first and foremost take a look at uh, tax cuts, uh, how you work the plan, how it fits into the budget, and how the governor's $850 million fine yesterday affects what's already been worked on. Senator? Uh, absolutely. Well, um, first of all, the, the agreed and compromised plan between the uh, House and the Senate on this tax plan is about a $750 million to $760 million tax cut, uh, depending on the, the forecast you look at on. And what it does is uh, it takes a 21 and a quarter percent reduction in the personal income tax across all brackets. And then it has a 100% tax credit back on the personal property taxes you pay on your vehicles. And then it has a 50% tax credit associated with equipment and inventory for the small businesses of West Virginia uh, that have a million dollars of assets or less and then has a uh, 100% tax credit against the real property taxes paid by veterans who are at least 90% disabled. Um, We also put triggers into it. The triggers are based on economic growth. In the future, it goes back and takes a look at the CPI and uh, multiplies that toward the previous year's revenue collections, sends that forward to look and see what the estimate should be for those collections in the, the next year. And then when we get above that, we start looking at tax cuts um, on the personal income tax capped at 10% a year. And that's, that's the gist of the tax cut, but it really, it came down to not just it alone. Uh, there's several things that had to come in play. One of the ways that we were able to get up from the Senate side from a $600 million level up into this 750, 760 range has to do with um, getting PIA fixed. Uh, was a huge part of that. In order to fix PIA, we had to go in and figure out a different way to do state employee raises. So it's kind of a three-legged stool. And I, I tell you, um, I can't give enough credit to Senate President Craig Blair. Um, he's a, um incredible leader because this has been a very contentious, um, it's been a very thoughtful process in getting uh, this this done. And um, he's been uh, the leader here in the Senate that's made it happen. So um, I, you know, I'm, I'm very... Uh, I'm very grateful that the 15th district has sent him down here to the Senate to help us get this done. Our pleasure, sir. Uh, <laughs> uh, and in regards to the governor's additional revenue uh, announced yesterday of $850 million for next year, how does this affect things? What it does, uh, when they raise the revenue estimates, it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of odd. You, you do a tax cut, which reduces your revenue, but it raises the revenue estimate in order. So, you know, it's, it's kind of an oxymoron almost there. But... One of the things that's happened is is, is that the, um, as I'm sure you're aware, a lot of the revenue estimates have been artificially lowered relative to what their collections expectations has been from the executive. And uh, to give, you know, for instance, this year's surplus would have been estimated at around 1.7 billion. So if we're going to go in and do a tax, a revenue reduction in our budgets, then what has to happen is that if you're going to reduce the revenue, for instance, um, in the Senate's version, we had our passed a $648 million tax cut, which meant we had to find $648 million in the budget to cut in order to do that. So when you cut it, there's two ways you can do it. You can take it completely out of the budget, or you can put it into what's called the surplus section of the budget, and we refer to it a lot of times up here as the back of the budget. And what, The only place you can really go grab that kind of money um, to move, it has to is usually in um, and it's DHHR. So you go into social services and medical services, and uh, which is your Medicaid, and you move that to the back of the budget and you put it right in the very front line because in the back of the budget things are funded in the order they're there. If you get more money than was anticipated by the revenue estimate, so we had to move about four hundred and eighty some million uh, of. Um, Medicaid services into the back of the budget. Well, when the governor raises the revenue estimate, what it does is it starts pulling that stuff that was in the top lines of the back of the budget back into the front. So it's uh, it's really um, uh, it doesn't change what we're spending money on. It just changes the uh, process by which it's spent, I guess. 
So in reality, he didn't really find $850 million. It's just a more realistic outlook on what the revenues will be the next year. That's accurate. Yes. Uh, Matt Harvey. Good morning, Chairman Tar. Good to talk to you. Good morning, Matt. Um, is this speaking about this, these revenue estimates? That 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 is the, the governor has a lot of control in that area, and, and almost exclusively. Is is that a process problem that the legislature believes it needs to work on? Well, it's um, you know we had uh, some extensive budget hearings over here in the Senate where we went through and did all the agencies once through and then had our committee come back together and our caucus, frankly, go through and have a lot of questions off those budget hearings. And then we came back on a Friday and had a four and a half hour budget hearing with every one of the secretaries in the Senate Finance Committee with with very specific questions prepared them relative to their previous budget presentations to try to figure out what the, the forecast of expenditures are for the state over the next five years. And one of the reasons we had to do that in the manner that we did, which was um, unique, is that this governor has not given us a revenue estimate since he's been in office, or excuse me, not given us a a six-year plan since he's been in office. Now, traditionally, it's not required by law, um, and tradition sometimes is good, sometimes it's bad. But in this case, it's it's a useful tradition is that the governor will provide the legislature a six-year plan that gives a six-year estimate of revenues and then a six-year estimate of obligations of the state on expenses. So there's a lot of bills we pass up here, as you know, that has an expense associated with with that bill. So you pass a policy, and in order to implement the policy, there's a monetary value to a lot of those. Those come through finance. When we pass something that has a a year-after-year financial obligation, That's included in that six-year plan because sometimes it steps up over years. Sometimes it doesn't get implemented until two or three years out after you pass it. What we've not been able to see from the legislature is anything like that from the governor's office. So we had to go in in the Senate and build a five-year. We we did a five-year because we couldn't get all the way out to six-year in the time frame that we needed to to get this negotiation done to figure out what level of tax cut we were comfortable with. So we had to go through and off those budget hearings build from the legislative side what we saw as a five-year plan. Here's the revenue estimates and here's the expense estimates. So in that process, it gives us a better idea both of what we think those revenue, what those collections will actually be, and also give us a better idea of what we think the actual expenses are and what the delta is between the two. Um, But that revenue estimate piece is extremely powerful for the governor when that revenue estimate is very high. And then he wants to come back and then suddenly lower it. In this case, the revenue estimate wasn't high to begin with. So the only place he can go up, go with it really to any leverage position, is, and even then it's not a leverage position, is to move the revenue estimate up. Chairman Tarr, we, we hear that, that the uh, severance taxes are, are high right now because, not necessarily because they're producing, you know, they're mining more coal or pumping more gas, but it's based on market conditions that the price is up. Um, do, do you have an idea of how long that, that will sustain, those, those higher prices? You know, that's, that's uh, as you know, the gas severance. Um, and gas is where, where that, a lot of that volatility is right now in the market on price. Um, and, you know, both coal and gas are volatile revenue sources. But gas is more volatile than, than coal. And the majority of our severance that we're seeing this, this spike, so we're 281% above our estimate right now. That is due to the volatility of a spike in the price on, on gas severance. Now, there's been some increased um, you know, exploration for gas in West Virginia, but not to, but the, by and large, it's off of the price. And so one of the things that, that um, we've been very careful with, at least from the Senate side, is to make sure that anything that we're doing, these future forecasts that what's available for a tax reduction is not dependent on, on those severance collections. And the reason is because we're 281 percent above estimates now, we could just as easily in in months or a year be 281 percent below estimates. So the tax cut that we went forward with is not based on severance collections. Very good. The month of February, we had uh, House Majority Leader Eric Householder on yesterday 
I'm sorry, make that the 27th, so that would have been Tuesday or Monday. And he was telling us the uh, the numbers for February that he had were through the 27th, and at that point there was a $76 million surplus for the month of February. I understand now with the final numbers in, that reached $111 million, Senator Tarr? That's correct, yeah. And it's uh, one of the things that, that stood out to me on there just uh, was that corporate net was significantly different than it was February a year ago. Um, and that's one of the things, at least from this seat, when I'm trying to figure out what the outlook might look like in the coming months, is when our businesses are doing really well, then we can expect that our personal income tax is going to continue to do well. Our sales tax is going to continue to do well because that all starts from you know, our employers putting that money into um, into the market. Well, this one of the things that's an anomaly, it is up $111 million over the revenue forecast, which is about 138% over the, the revenue forecast. But when you go back and compare it to February a year ago, the drop is about 19% in our corporate net. So um, so I'm looking at it right now with a, with a bit of caution. Um, and uh, the Senate's been looking at this at it with a bit of caution from the word go um, at the beginning of this session. But um, I'm hoping that's a timing issue, and that's one of the things we're working out right now is it could be a, a collections timing issue, but we've not got that vetted out thoroughly yet. Is your so fear other than that it uh, looks good? Is your fear that it represents maybe the greater problem of an economic slowdown caused by current market conditions? That is my fear. Matt Miller, Senator Tarr, as far as the budget that you mentioned at, at four point six billion, as the tax cut plans continue to be negotiated and and hopefully ultimately passed by the end of the session, is that already played into that four point six billion dollar budget? Would those tax cuts? Uh, occur starting here this year yeah those the the bill that we passed actually goes back to january of 23 so that they would go through so yes it's contemplated which is why the governor had to go in and do the revenue estimate change he did otherwise um uh, you know the budget the things that would have been moved from the front of the budget to the back of the budget would have been much more substantial than just those medicaid services you probably had to get into higher ed and everything else to move that back and frankly the revenues are there so we we have those revenues to be able to do it and uh you know i think you moved an artificially low revenue estimate back toward a a uh, closer to what the actual revenue estimate is but the reality is if we're anticipating a 1.7 billion dollar surplus then you would expect that a revenue estimate would have probably been 1.7 million dollars or billion dollars more than what the actual revenue estimate came to us as so I want to change the the subject, if you will, just a bit in regards to you you mentioned, um, and Senator uh, Blair has mentioned as well, uh, the the idea of that three-pronged stool in the tax cuts and so forth, and and included in that is PEIA. Uh, But we had Fred Albert on from uh, one of the teachers' unions here in the state earlier this week, and he talked about how it's still, there's not a funding source specifically for PEIA, and that is a concern for those teachers' unions. Can you address that that? PEIA shortfall, and and is there a place, uh, is there a specific funding that can help correct that? You know, the funding on there is the general revenue budget. So, and I've told people this all the time, there's, we have special interest groups like, uh, like the teachers unions that come in and others that like to chase a specific earmark off of a revenue source to say, okay, we've got something that's dedicated to this. There's no more stable earmark than the general revenue um, that comes in. And the reason is because general revenue is, is going to go in based off multiple revenue sources. And the way I would liken this to in your home budget is if you say you got your job that you go to and um, that you're working through the day and maybe you got a side gig you're hitting on the weekends and then maybe you got a small business that you're operating as well. And each one of those have a different depend, um, predictability for your revenue. So if you're on a salary, that job you're working day by day, you know every two weeks or every month you've got an exact dollar amount that's coming to you. On your small business, you may have months you lose money and months you make money. And then on your side gig over there, you're going to, it depends how many hours. you got some more control over that because the more hours that you do, you work, then the more money you're going to make, and you can move your hours up or down. The general revenue is like that. Each, each revenue source has a different characteristic to it. When you go in and you tie 
a earmark something to a specific revenue source, you take out the ability for other revenue sources to uh, dampen a negative impact when that revenue source goes down. So, so I think that, um, for one, uh, to go in and, and say that there's not an earmark for PIA is either a complete lack of understanding of how the revenue works for the state budget, or it's a significant, and if you do understand it, then it's a direct misinterpretation or disingenuousness that comes on how PIA is funded. We just secured PIA within the Senate, this legislature, and I think that through the legislature, as it goes through, the PIA just got protected because what was about to happen with PIA, the network was falling apart. We had hospital in uh, Wheeling that came out initially and said, if we're going to stop taking PIA in July, and the reason is, is that the reimbursement for treating a person who has PIA was at 50% of Medicare. And what that means to any provider, whether it's a hospital or individual provider, is that when you come to them for treatment, they're going to pay you to treat you. That's, that's the situation that PIA is in right now. And so if it doesn't get fixed, it wouldn't matter what we provide for insurance to a state employee if there's nobody that will take their insurance. So it had to be fixed for one on the reimbursement side. So the PIA bill takes that reimbursement, takes it to 110% of Medicare. The other thing that it does, is we went through incident in order to do that reimbursement. So that's an added expense on a system that was already falling apart. And the reason it was falling apart is that the premiums being paid in the PIA were less than the expenses PIA was incurring. And the way the legislature has been making that up is going back in and backfilling a reserve fund for shortfalls against those expenditures. Well, in doing that, we bypass moving the money through payroll. Now, this gets in the weeds, but when you move the money through payroll, there's a federal match that comes down the significance, about 32% of the 80% that goes in. And the reason there's a federal match is that many of the employees in the state are in agencies that are dependent upon federal funding. So the state administers PIA for the state employees on behalf of the federal government when that's the case. We were missing that federal drawdown, and that's you know, tens of millions of dollars. So in going through to um, fix PA, part of the thing we had to do is we had to get it back to where it was a true 80-20 plan, and so that the federal government was paying their, their piece of it and that we weren't getting to a spot to where the state was doing entirely backfilling all that loss through the reserve fund because what was going to happen is within a few years, by 2027, we were going to be nearly a billion dollars upside down on PIA to the tune of $450 million a year by 2028 and growing. So we, for one, had to, to make sure the federal government was paying their piece, two, we had need to make sure we stabilized the PI um, program so that our state employees have health care providers to go to. And then the third thing is, is that it required a significant premium bump to do that. So when we're looking at the pay raise, traditionally what we've been, the governor has put out is a 5% average pay raise. So they go in, they average it, and that weights higher toward the top end of the brackets within um, the, the, the state employees. So what we did instead this time is we did a flat $2,300 pay raise across all state employees. Now, if, um, if you're in the schools, for instance, and um, you're a school service personnel, and you may be at some of the lower income brackets, not all of them, but some of them are in lower income brackets, this is just a spot to point out, your premium increase is not all that, that large. Now, it may be relative to your income, but the pay raise that you get is significant um, to the point it could be thirteen to $1,700 more than your premium increase. So it's a significant raise. When you get to the top end of the bracket, the very top end of the bracket for PIA that pays into it represents less than 1% of the state employees. If the less, that, that less than 1% has the absolute best PIA plan, has their entire family on it, and then you measure the premium that they're paying against the pay raise, they're still better off with the pay raise. Now, it's around 100 bucks or less on just the pay raise itself. But this is where the tax cut comes in, because on the 21 and a quarter percent tax cuts, the top bracket on the just a straight PIT gets the most relief on a percentage basis. So when you're talking somebody's making more than $130,000 a year as a state employee, 
then they're at that six and a half for most of their income. They're going to get a significant tax break relative to on that that piece relative to somebody who's on that very lower end of the tax brackets. Senator Tar, on that so note, all I have, together. have to jump in because we have to get into our break here before the hour ends. I appreciate your time this morning and thanks for the information, sir. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on.